So hello, everyone. Thanks for um, joining. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the implementation um, of genome sequencing as a clinical diagnostic service within our laboratory here um, at the Lab for Molecular Medicine, um, part of Partners Healthcare. Um, so just quickly, before I go on, um, just as a quick disclosure, this presentation discusses Gene Insight, which is a software that we've developed that has been licensed um, by Partners Healthcare and it's wholly owned 100% um, by Partners Healthcare. So in general, the laboratory testing workflow um, is, is something I'm sure all of you are fairly familiar with, but the, the test will, will come in or it will be ordered by the, by the doctor and by the genetic counselor. Um, the case will come into the laboratory, it will be accessioned by the laboratory, um, DNA will be extracted or RNA depending upon what the actual test that's being ordered. Um, there will be some sort of wet lab processing, um, the technical component of the actual assay, the case management of that whole um, entire assay, and actually understanding sort of what tests were being ordered um, from this sort of sample that came in. Um, any bioinformatics processes that are actually a component of the um, wet lab um, technical component would then be run. The variants that were um, identified would be um, pulled out. These would then be curated by the, um, by the experts at the laboratory, by fellows, genetic counselors, um, variant scientists, um, geneticists, pathologists, whoever it might be. The case would end up being drafted and signed out and the report would be delivered back to the clinician. So this is a general sort of laboratory testing workflow. And for genome and exome sequencing, it's really not that different. Um, although there are a few sort of caveats and um, specific differences that, that, that are useful to point out. So in general, um, a similar sort of thing happens where the, the patient workup consent and test order comes through. Um, you also then have the phenotype and family history capture. So for something like genome and exome sequencing, obviously this ends up being a little bit more important because you're sort of casting a wider net um, and you need to have the ability to sort of focus in on the, the variants that might be relevant for specific phenotypes. And so in having a, a more detailed phenotype and family history capture method is obviously one important component. Um, in addition, I'll, I'll touch on this a little later, the consent process is actually very important for genome sequencing um, for both sort of the, the general sort of clinical consent, but also for the idea of incidental findings and, and potential research um, from negative cases. Once the sequencing is done, um, there's an additional need to sort of enrich the annotations of these variants because there may be filtration strategies that are necessary. And so really before you do the manual analysis of identifying variants that are important for, uh, potentially important or relevant for this particular case, you need to have some sort of automated way to really enrich these variants and then filter down on these variants. So this is sort of a, something that's slightly more unique in the exome and, and genome realm that's not necessarily um, considered usually in the, the target realm. You still then have the manual analysis to determine the interpretation of these variants, um, any sort of confirmation of, of variants that you identify that you're going to put on the report. And in addition for, for genome sequencing and exome sequencing, you oftentimes actually have more than one report. So you don't just have the sort of initial report that is targeted for this sort of primary indication for the test that's being ordered, but you may have an additional sort of incidental findings report, um, which I'll touch on at the end of the, of the talk. And finally, although it's great if, if, if all genetic testing ends up sort of in the, the EHR and, and can be used for clinical decision support, sort of the the vast amount of variants you would get for genomic sequencing, it's actually, um, in a sense, it's more important to make sure that data gets in there because there's a lot more sort of clinical decision support rules and longitudinal support for the patient that you can sort of gather from genome and exome sequencing. So this is a quick sort of overview. Um, I'm sure everyone here knows a lot about exome and genome sequencing, but Exome sequencing really is just sort of a, a targeted type of sequencing. So it is still involves capture of specific regions. Here you're just sort of capturing what you're considering the, the exome. It's important to remember though that exomes actually sort of vary in, in what is the definition of an exome. So it may or may not include the five prime and three prime UTR regions of the genes. It may or may not include uh, microRNAs and it may or may not include unannotated transcripts. And so the way you define an exome actually could be di different um, depending upon how a, a certain clinical lab or, or other lab actually wants to define their exome. In addition, there's really still not one set of what an exome even is. And so if we look at some of the, um, some of the actual sources where, where you might get exome, exome information from, 
something like RAPSEEK, Ensemble, UCSC, or this um, consensus CDS effort, which is sort of a, a grouping of, of those three efforts, you can see that there's different numbers of genes, um, and it varies widely, as well as different number of transcripts. And so depending upon which route you actually choose, um, you may actually have, again, a different definition of what your exome is. So it's important just to remember that exomes differ between, uh, potentially differ between different laboratories. Um, genome sequencing, on the other hand, doesn't involve capture. So there's a shotgun-based sequencing method. Um, so there's a little less bias in, in what is actually being sequenced. However, it is important to remember genome sequencing, sort of like exome sequencing, isn't necessarily whole genome sequencing. And so today, um, only about 2.9 gigabases of the uh, 3.1 total gigabases actually have defined sequence. So the telomeres and centromeres don't have any defined sequence. Um, in addition, when you're going through genome sequencing, typically 95% completeness um, at, say, 30 or, or 50x coverage is, is, um, is what you'll end up getting. But that's even not the case. And, and, and there's some systematic sort of dropout, but it also could be random dropout for between different samples of what is actually covered in one genome sequencing assay to the next one. So just as a, a quick comparison, um, genome versus exome sequencing, they both sort of have um, benefits and, and, and caveats. Um, like I said, there's less bias in genome sequencing, and so you actually might get more completeness of, of the exome depending upon how things are, are actually targeted. However, exome sequencing by its nature, because it's much more limited in focus, you can get actually higher coverage um, on average. And so you tend to actually have the ability to identify more true positive variants that are just not covered as well um, in genome sequencing. Also, there's still a cost differential between exome and genome sequencing. So sort of the estimated reagent costs um, today are approximately $2,000 for exome sequencing. This is sort of give or take a little bit. It may, may be a little less now. Um, and you can pool probably two to four samples per high seq length or, or to get um, pretty good coverage for, for your exome sequencing. Genome sequencing, on the other hand, is maybe in the four to $5,000 range for the reagent costs. Um, and you actually need to use one full flow cell in order to actually capture um, enough of the sequence to get high enough coverage. One important caveat to remember, though, is that this doesn't include necessarily the computational and bioinformatics costs or the personnel costs. So the personnel costs would actually probably be similar between the two approaches today. However, the computational cost, the storage, and the compute time is actually still much greater um, in genome sequencing. And I'll get a little bit into the numbers from our genome sequencing um, in a couple slides. So the, the cost per genome sequencing, I know everyone has seen this slide before, but this is sort of the average cost per genome sequencing. So the amount of uh, dollars it takes to actually complete a, a full genome. And one of the things that, that we were thinking of when we decided to launch our test, which actually was in, in 2011, was that um, we decided to choose genome sequencing as our, our first primary approach, approach rather than exome sequencing because of the, the limitations of exome sequencing at the time, the more completeness of genome sequencing, um, and also because the costs were coming down. But as you can see, the costs haven't yet quite um, continued to drop. In 2012, 2013, that's sort of more flatlined. And so the actual cost difference between exome genome sequencing is, is still relevant today as what it was a couple of years ago. And so there's still um, higher costs to do genome sequencing. Um, so that's why we are considering actually launching additional exome sequencing in, in, um, in addition to what we're doing for genome sequencing now as a service. But this is sort of a, um, an, a second tier approach from, from what our, our primary focus is for the genome sequencing. So genome sequencing um, in our lab at the, the Lab for Molecular Medicine. So initially, testing is being done for sort of the diagnostic context. Um, and in this case, we'll be returning primary indication reports um, for, for the actual proband. Um, we'll also have the option of enabling incidental findings reports. And, and at the end of the talk, I'm going to go through a lot more detail how we've actually structured these reports. So you can sort of see how they're, they're laid out in, in our minds and for, um, for the genome sequencing. The incidental findings report, we have a, a general genome report which casts a very wide net for incidental findings, which is um, in our consent process going to be an opt-out. Um, and also ACMG guidelines report, um, if someone decides to opt out of the general genome report, they have the option of doing just the ACMG recommended um, 27 diseases uh, report, um, or they have the option today of still not getting any incidental findings report if that's requested. And, and really, this is going to be a phone call because we want to understand why people 
are choosing to do maybe the full incidental findings or the limited incidental findings or actually no incidental finding report. So um, testing for healthy individuals, we're actually doing this today in the concept, uh, um, through our, our collaboration with the MedSeq study. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the end, but we um, would be interested in, in actually offering this for healthy individuals, but it was gonna depend upon the, the cue of the sort of diagnostic context. So anyone who's doing it for a diagnostic context would actually have priority within our laboratory um, as opposed to healthy individuals. So why would someone sort of come and get genome sequencing? Again, I'm sure everyone has um, some familiarity with this. Today, um, it's really not used for places where there's a clear indication and where there's a good targeted assay for that test. And so we really want people to come in who have either maybe had prior genetic testing, um, but have not yet have found an etiology for their disease, or they have sort of an extreme phenotype. Um, there's no real clear way to create a unifying diagnosis for what they have. There's no clear indication of a targeted test to approach first. And the reason why we, we would recommend that people get targeted testing first is, as I mentioned, the, the coverage and completeness of both exome and genome sequencing today isn't yet what we have for targeted sequencing. And so there's a, the risk of actually missing the, the true variant just because the, the coverage um, aspect of the genes that you're focusing in on might not be there. And then, as I mentioned, there is um, potential for patients who have a desire to inform their medical risk. Uh, so that's something that, that we would consider to, um, to perform, but it's sort of in the context of, of all the other cases that we have in um, in-house. So this is sort of just another view of the, the whole genome sequencing process. I'm going to use this sort of as a guideline to take us through how we've actually implemented genome sequencing here at the LMM. So um, the first thing that happens is the, the case sort of gets received in accession within the laboratory and the, the technical component of genome sequencing is performed. So we've actually created a simplified requisition form, um, which I'll, I'll show on the next page. Um, we're going to follow this up with a phone call for gathering detailed phenotypic information. Um, currently today, it's a, a paper requisition form, but it's sort of modeled after um, things like PhenoDB and PhenoTips, and so that way, when we have the ability, when we um, finally implement some of those systems that help us capture phenotypic data more readily, that should be an easy way to transition into um, one of those additional forms. Obviously, um, in Massachusetts, we need a clinical consent, so the clinical consent with the opt-in, opt-out, um, you know, with the opt-out of the um, incidental findings would be included. However, there's an additional thing to think about for genome sequencing, which is research consent. So internal samples here within partners. Um, we actually would like to get a research consent so we can have them available for, for biobanking purposes. Um, we're trying to start a, a large, we already have a biobanking initiative, but, but even make it um, a lot more fuller um, and expand um, beyond sort of the, the number of samples that we have today. And so this would be a prime way to actually get additional um, samples within the biobanking effort. And a, a, another unique thing sort of about exome and genome sequencing in a way is that because you're sort of already capturing a lot of this data, you may have cases that you come in, obviously you'll have a lot of cases that will be negative or inconclusive. And being sort of part of a broader um, research community here um, at Partners, we have the ability to actually form collaborations with, with researchers and sort of have a, um, a way to sort of share cases that have similar phenotypes and people can, can then sort of get together and have an exchange of, of patients who have actually consented for research in order to understand similar cases that they, they may not be able to pull together today. And that way there's the ability for researchers to identify multiple cases with similar phenotypes and actually sort of attack those together where they wouldn't have that um, opportunity before. So this is something that, that we'd also like to pursue um, for some of our clinical cases to see if they'd be interested in this sort of deeper level of, of research consent to be able to sort of um, tackle this in a, a broader community effort. So I'm not sure um, how well people can see this, but this is the, the simplified requisition form that we have. Um, sort of on the, the first page is a quick overview of any clinical information with sort of a rundown of, of primary disease areas or primary um, anatomy areas that someone can check whether it's abnormal, normal, or unknown. And it's abnormal, they can sort of type in some of the uh, quick findings for that specific um, area. There's also obviously um, for exome and genome sequencing and, and, and any actually genetic testing, um, family history is very important. So we want to be able to capture sort of what other individuals within this um, family have, both in a, a family tree-like structure, as well as sort of in a um, 
a tabular structure. And the tabular structure, we are interested in knowing who is potentially also available for both full sequencing and, and confirmation sequencing. So if we're interested in a proband, it's a potential de novo case, we may have the parents to sequence and, and get that um, information quicker. Maybe we only sequence a proband and then actually for variants that are interesting, see if they're actually de novo um, by looking at the parent for just that specific region. So there's different ways that, that you might actually capture sort of a, a specific clinical case. And it's important to know sort of what types of samples are actually involved um, and what, sorry, what sort of samples are, are available for testing and, and depending upon um, who actually is affected or unaffected may actually help you choose which samples to actually do sequencing on. So um, once the, the sort of the, the case is accessioned and, and processed in the laboratory, the, the genome sequencing component is done and it may be done within the lab, it may be done um, in external lab and, and brought in houses, the different ways you can actually do the genome sequencing. But once you sort of have the, um, the raw data from the genome sequencing, it's important then to obviously do the alignment, variant calling, annotation, um, all those sort of specific aspects that you're going to do with, um, to, to identify the variants within the particular individual. So what we've done here is we have actually um, used a, a modified version of BWA and GATK to sort of help paralyze our genome cases. So on average, we're getting um, 600 million paradigm reads approximately, which is about 250 gigabase in size um, for the actual um, compressed BAM file. This is an average depth of approximately 40x with 95 completeness, 95 percent completeness across the genome. And actually, to to take the the BAM file that we get originally, convert it, convert it back to a FASTQ, then do alignment over again and variant calling. We have this down for um, our genome sequences to be about 28 hours. Um, so it's obviously if someone's going to be implementing genome sequencing, it's important to know sort of how. Um, how, how long it takes to, to, to really be able to actually run one of these sequences through even um, a modified pipeline, be able to get it down. And it's not a, this is a fairly fast turnaround time, but it's still not as fast as it, it, it may need to be for specific use cases. Um, our current pipeline today identifies SNVs and small indels. Um, it's approximately 5 million variants um, called. Um, this is before sort of quality filtration metrics um, that we've established within our a laboratory for our specific pipeline. But sort of from the raw calls, we have about 5 million variants uh, per sample that are called, that are just um, SNVs and or small indels. Um, we then annotate these variants with uh, approximately 100 different features, and we include um, information from BEP, um, Alamit, which includes sort of conservation measures and silico prediction tools and, and a few different measures. Um, ESP and thousand genomes and other sort of population frequency data sets and, and a few other data sets. And so we sort of take these, these variants we've identified, do a very rich um, thorough annotation process on them, and then load them into what we, we're calling sort of our genetic data repository. So our genetic data repository sort of contains all the variants we've identified in the individuals. Um, it contains them per individual and it contains a separate table, which is sort of the annotations of all the variants we've ever identified. So we have a quick way to sort of do filtration and matching um, based upon sort of generic features of the of the different variants. And I'll get into the, the filtration in a couple slides. Um, but the way we're able to enable our filtration process is because we have sort of the um, this rich set of annotation data within our um, genomic data repository that we've, we've developed here. So when you're doing any sort of clinical genetic testing, obviously um, you need to do validation of your pipeline. You need to validate um, that you're actually getting what, you're, what you think you're getting. So you need to do robustness testing as well as sort of specificity and sensitivity testing. And so the way we approach this, we feel um, that sort of identification of any variant um, is similar, whether or not it's, it's benign or pathogenic, especially when you're doing full sequencing, you don't know most of the time what novel variants are actually doing. Um, until you sort of do a, a deeper curation. Even then, they might still be variants of unknown significance. And so the way we've tackled it is, is by sort of looking sort of globally, our ability to detect variation um, across a, a broad range of sequence. And so we actually have um, pretty in-depth sequencing for 195 genes, which is approximately 700 KB of sequence. Um, and this includes um, Sanger sequencing, um, sequencing by array and next generation sequencing for a lot of these different, um, at least two sort of different technologies for all these different 195 genes. So we sort of well characterize the variation that we've identified or we can identify um, within the 700 KB of sequence. 
And from that, we actually identified um, 425 variants that we've confirmed via Sanger and, and other methods um, within this data set, um, 15 of which were indels, 410 of which were SNVs. Um, and we were able to detect all of these um, using our pipeline to determine that you know we're actually identifying um, the variants that, that, that we want to be identifying based upon the, the coverage that we're getting at these positions. Um, we also want to do a, a sensitivity analysis. So again, within this sort of 700 KB of sequence, we want to identify any variants that we called via um, next-gen sequencing, uh, via whole genome sequencing that wasn't called via our, our other technologies. Um, and we had 20 false positive SNVs and, and one false positive indel. Um, and when we further characterized and looked more deeply into these specific regions, um, we, we understood that we could actually apply some sort of quality metrics to um, limit the, the false positive variants that we were identifying. So when we then went ahead and applied our quality metrics, so our Fisher strand, um, a strand bias Fisher metric uh, less than 30. So this is um, one of the outputs you can get from um, GATK, as well as a quality by depth score. If we were able to um, use these two fairly simple um, quality metrics, we actually were able to thoroughly reduce the amount of false positive variants um, that we've identified. And in practice today, um, this, this still holds true. Uh, we, when we use our, our quality metrics, we actually have a fairly limited number of, of false positive variants. What we more probably get is actually false annotation calls. So something is called sort of a frame shift when it's actually two frame shifts ne next to each other and it's actually sort of a, a three uh, base pair in frame deletion or something like that. So, so most of the time, any discrepancies we get are actually based upon the annotations today and not necessarily based um, on, on false positive variations. We also wanted to do um, concordance results. Um, obviously, Thousand Genomes data is, is a great data set to look at. Um, however, it, it's hard to determine which of these would, would actually be the gold standard. So we wanted to see what our concordance rate was with um, variants called the Thousand Genomes. And so when we went through that process, we actually had a fairly high concordance rate, especially for um, single nucleotide variants across the entire genome. Um, so we actually had 99% uh, of calls that were present within um, 1,000 genomes were also present within our genome sequencing for SNVs, um, and 91% concordance um, with indel calls across the, 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 the two data sets. Um, there was, when we looked at sort of variants with, with matched genotypes, so a HET versus a HET, so we called it a HET and Thousand Genomes called it a HET, or we called the homozygous variant and Thousand Genomes called it a homozygous variant. Um, we still had very high um, concordance rate. It, it dropped um, a little bit as, as would be expected, but it's actually good um, sort of reassurance that the, the variants that we're calling seem to be um, identified via, via other methods as well. So, so once you've sort of gone through the whole process and you've, you've identified the, the full set and full, full range of variants um, that you've seen um, from your genome sequencing or, or exome sequencing case, the next step really is to target, um, to, to filter these variants because it's slightly different obviously than, than a targeted panel. The way we approach our targeted testing is we actually manually interpret every single variant that we identify within the targeted region and we um, associate all of those sort of with the case in, in some sort of um, framework from say benign to, to pathogenic. However, with exome and genome sequencing, it's not technically possible actually to, or, or physically possible to actually do this manual interpretation of, of all 100,000 or uh, 5 million variants, whatever you get for the different technologies. And so you actually need a way to sort of filter down um, based upon both sort of the, the phenotype and the genetics to a, to a more limited set of, of variants that would then go on for the, sort of to the manual filtration steps. So this is sort of one general way if you can think about how filtration metrics might be performed in, in the, in the um, approach of genome sequencing. And so you have your whole, whole genome sequencing um, test, which identifies um, in the millions of variants. Um, you may then look for sort of things that are novel or low frequency variants. So in the context of sort of rare disorders or Mendelian inherited conditions, obviously we're looking for things that are, are more rare. In the context of common disease, you may be looking for more common variants, but since we're mostly focused on sort of rare, um, rare disorders and, and, and Mendelian disorders, you actually want to focus on um, limited to sort of the no novel and low frequency variants. Um, so using things like ESP and 1,000 genomes for different populations. We actually then um, 
may, depending upon our knowledge and our ability to interpret, limit this to sort of variants that are in gene or, or non-coding or conserved regions. Um, from there, you want to look at things that have actually then be associated to the disease that you're interested in. So if the individual comes in with specific phenotypes or specific diagnosis, you may want to first, as first pass, sort of limit it to, to the genes and diseases within um, that context. You then would then obviously do um, look at the variants that are predicted to be pathogenic, maybe they're, they're loss of function and genes that are known to have loss of function variants. Um, they're previously reported in, in other databases, um, or there's actual sort of manual curation um, to get that, or uh, other methods to sort of identify variants that might be uh, pathogenic. You then do manual curation to see if there's, there's anything that is actually clinically relevant. One of the, the sort of interesting things about genome and exome sequencing is there's, there's probably a need to do an iterative process for some cases. So in cases where it's sort of inconclusive or negative, you may then sort of need to, to broaden the net wider to be able to identify more variants that should go through this pipeline and then through the manual curation. One of the tricky things is to identify when it's appropriate to stop here. So, so when do you actually have a negative case? And that's one of the things that, that is obviously challenging in, in the concept of genome and exome sequencing is at what stage you end up reporting sort of a, a negative or um, uh, inconclusive um, finding. Finally, you're, you're probably identifying in the range of, of five to 10 variants or, or maybe even zero that you would actually end up on the final report, things that you've thoroughly investigated. Um, you've been able to sort of associate um, a clinical significance and it has some relevance to the, the patient's phenotype. And these are what may end up sort of on the final report that, that, that gets delivered to the clinician. So some general approaches to filtration, obviously everyone um, may have some experience with this and there, there's different things that you may do. So if you're looking for sporadic disorders, um, you may want to identify de novo variants. Um, usually this is a, a much easier approach if you have just one or two uh, per exome. Obviously you need to have the parental sequences here as well. So, so there's some issues with, with cost analysis of, of identifying um, the, the cost for something that may be de novo. Um, is it worth sort of doing the parents right away and then just filtering down to those ones that you know are de novo? Or is it actually, um, is that actually less expensive than sort of doing the filtration on the, the child first and then doing Sanger confirmation of the additional variants? So there's sort of a, a cost benefit analysis for doing the, the parents um, as well as the uh, individual in this case. Um, recessive disorder is, is, is equal. You're looking for genes that have sort of rare um, Biallelic variants. Um, obviously, when you have multiple affected siblings, the, the power to detect these would actually increase. Um, for consanguineous families, you may search for rare homozygous variants because you're expecting um, actually to be a, a more homozygous variant that is that is causing the phenotype. Um, Dom disorders can tend to be the trickiest, but you may then have the ability to identify distantly related cousins um, and have those be the two people that end up being sequenced. And so then um, have the ability to narrow down to, to specific variants that are shared among distantly affected um, individuals. Um, and then cancer, sort of doing a filtration where you compare somatic versus germline results. Um, and you can identify those variants that are specifically occurring um, within the tumor. So the way that we're approaching this, obviously, we're, we're, we're actually returning two reports, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in a second. But for our variant filtration, um, the primary indication filtration is really based upon, like I said, the combination of genetics and indication. Do we think it's recessive? Do we think it's dominant? Do we think it's de novo? And also what the actual phenotype is. And so can we limit it down to a certain set of genes? And so we've developed sort of a, a method here of our, our gene panel selection, where we actually have the ability to go in and, and focus on um, or try to identify the variants that are at a, a first tier sort of highly likely to be relevant to this phenotype or disease and maybe then a second tier, so genes that are related in, in different pathways or have expression data that might suggest that they're also related to this potential phenotype or disease. Um, and from here, we also created sort of a web database link to, to help us with this gene panel selection tool for anything that's known today of, of sort of gene disease phenotype relationships. And so based upon the phenotypes that we're, we're getting and um, potentially diseases that we're getting, we have the ability to do a first pass on, on genes that may be relevant for that particular phenotype. Um, and then our, our general genome filtration, this is our um, expanded incidental findings report. And so really what we're looking for is variants that have been previously characterized as disease causing in, in um, available databases, predicted loss of function variants um, within the medical exome. And again, because we're, we're doing this sort of in the Mendelian context, we're looking at variants um, that are 
less than a 5% subpopulation minor allele frequency. So we can limit the scope of things that we actually end up doing manual assessment on. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go go through these two reports a little bit later on in the presentation, but this is sort of the way that we're thinking about the, the filtration process. Um, so, so the variant assessment process, this is um, really when you determine the, the, the level of, um, or when you determine sort of the, the category or the classification of this particular variant related to specific diseases. And so obviously there, there's a few different ways to do this. Um, you want to gather as many sources as you can. As I mentioned before, we have approximately 100 different annotations we have on the variants. And then what we do is we, we go through this very manual process we have to look at specific variants in more detail. So this includes sort of looking at um, different publicly available databases such as ClinVar, um, DMUDB from the UK and, and uh, an effort that I'm involved in um, with, with bringing in sort of variants within the, the Canadian lab. So it's our, sort of Canadian variants or, or variants identified in Canadian laboratories and having a centralized instance for those. Um, so different sources of, of clinically interpreted disease variants is, is obviously a little higher grade than, than sort of things that are reported pathogenic in the literature. Then do a, a variant assessment. So it's a the thorough review of over these hundred these hundred different uh, features. Um, and we have an expanded, this, this very thorough Excel template, which I'll, I'll show quickly in the next slide, that, um, that, that we actually make available for other people to use if they're interested, which helps us actually determine um, the class, gather all the data and help determine sort of the classification for these particular variants um, related to specific diseases. Um, one unique thing sort of about genome sequencing that, that we actually hadn't had a, a counter before is usually when you do targeted sequencing, you actually have a clear definition of genes that are associated to diseases and their strength of association before you start, or else you wouldn't necessarily have included them on your targeted assay. If you do include them, you know that they're very strongly associated with disease or they have mild association disease. However, when you start doing genome and exome sequencing, one of the important things is you actually end up getting these genes and, and diseases that you actually don't know sort of what the, the clinical phenotype is. So there's actually a need to sort of do gene assessments um, at, at, at the start or, or as soon as variants are identified. So it's a, it's a unique paradigm shift for, for us where we actually then have to identify variants and then go back and see, okay, we identified this variant that someone said was, was pathogenic, but is that gene really even associated with disease or not? So that's something that is um, sort of new in our laboratory. And actually one of the other geneticists in our laboratory, um, Gary Funk, is actually doing this in, in collaboration um, with Midori Hede at Emory and um, Abney Stavatini at um, CHOP to actually look at what we're calling the medical exome and actually using a community um, effort to go ahead and, and sort of tackle the, the, the genes that, that, that we know have some association with disease and actually be able to rank those and, and, and see how strongly we can say that they're associated to specific diseases. And so that time when you, when you actually get a variant um, in one of these diseases, it's a lot easier to see, okay, what is the real evidence for this gene disease association? So this is just a, a quick snapshot of one of the pages for our um, variant assessment. This is, we have like an 18 tab Excel file that we go through manually um, for a specific variants to determine their clinical relevance to disease. Um, we're in the process of sort of modifying this all the time. And so it, it's becoming a lot more user friendly and a lot more um, nicer to actually navigate through. So this is something that if anyone's interested, we'd actually be willing to share and, and, and sort of help um, other people sort of go through this process and then how we're thinking about sort of the, the clinical variant assessment piece. Um, of our interpretation process. So once we've identified variants, again, we start with the three to five million variants, we apply the filters, we do this manual assessment. We then sort of bin them um, in the Mendelian world into sort of benign, likely benign, BUS, likely pathogenic or pathogenic. And one different thing sort of a genome and exome sequencing is, is previously we've really associate every variant we identify with the report. However, today there's just so many more variants. There's so many variants we don't even classify because they don't meet the filtration strategies or things we classify as likely benign or, or VUS. And so actually what ends up on the report in the sort of genome and exome world for, in our laboratory is actually going to be pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants and the, a subset of variants of unknown significance, which really seem to be associated with the phenotype or have a, a much stronger correlation of potentially being associated with the phenotype. So it really is a slight a different paradigm um, for our laboratory and how we're actually going about and actually reporting these, these cases. Um, 
the, the other paradigm shift in our laboratory is, is previously, we actually do confirmation of all variants that are going to end up on the report, so all pathogenic and BUS and likely pathogenic variants. What we did in the past is, is in targeted testing systems, we're going to include every variant. We, we do our confirmation before we actually do the assessment process. But we've actually had to switch this sort of um, to, to save cost and time. We actually do the assessment first and then actually go and do the um, variant confirmation. And the reason for this is, is for most things in genome and exome sequencing, we actually haven't yet identified um, the, the cases previously or the, the, these regions previously, and so we've never actually looked at them. So we actually don't have primers for our variant confirmation process. And so we actually want to limit it to the things that are most likely to end up on the report and sort of do our assessment process first and then go forward with the, um, the confirmation process. So it's a, it's a shift in sort of how we actually do things today in our laboratory. And so it creates this sort of need to develop an automated primer design pipeline, what we're calling primer design on the fly. So it actually increases the, the variant efficiency with our laboratory and enables faster turnaround time. Because now when we sort of identify something that we, we need to confirm, we can throw it into this pipeline, develop, uh, design the primers efficiently and quickly and actually go and order them and, and bring them back. And so this actually has been saving some time and, and helping our turnaround time for our, our genome cases. Um, and currently today for confirmation, we're, since we're identifying SNVs and, and small indels, um, we're using Sanger confirmation sequencing. But as our sort of capabilities to call variants expands, um, we have the ability to also bring in GDPCR for sort of smaller um, copy number variants, as well as using a genotyping array to actually look at larger copy number and, and LOH changes. And so sort of the, the way we actually do variant confirmation is going to slightly shift as our capabilities of calling variants shift. And this is, shows the importance of sort of having a, a case management system, which allows you to sort of link together the different technologies that you're using for confirmation and the, the different primary assays and be able to reconcile any differences between the, um, the different technologies that you're using to, to look for variants. So once you, you have the variants you've identified that you want to then proceed with for genome and exome sequencing, this is when the um, you sort of draft the case and, and put it into the context for this specific individual and, and, and do the sign-out process. So I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about both of our, our um, primary indication report. And our primary indication report is sort of the, it's based on the, the model that we used um, for the, the, clarity, um, the clarity challenge. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the clarity challenge, but it was um, last year sponsored by, by Children's Hospital in Boston. And really what it was is a way to develop sort of clinical pipelines and, and reporting structures for genome and exome sequencing cases. Um, and we, our group worked pretty closely with the um, Brigham and Women's Hospital um, genetics group in sort of defining the pipeline and, and defining sort of the, the structure of the report. And, and our, our full team won, and, and a lot of the reason why we won was the, the, the structure of our sort of genome report and what we were able to return um, to the clinician. We've also then developed a general genome report, which is again is our incidental findings report. And this is what we're using for the MedSeq project. The MedSeq project is a, a large UL1 project that is spearheaded by Robert Green um, here at the Brigham. And what it is, is, is really looking at um, both individuals with disease and healthy individuals and giving them back um, genome findings and seeing sort of how the doctors, um, both primary care clinicians and, and specialists actually deal with sort of the scope of, of genome data and actually identify sort of the outcomes and, and anything that they may do differently based upon the, the reports that they're getting back. And so this is um, the, the first sort of targeted ap approach that, that we're taking. And so I'm going to go through a little bit more detail how we are, we're structuring those reports as well. Um, and then for, for drafting and sign up, we actually use our uh, in-house gene insight software, which enables us to sort of create templates and um, create templates in the process to enable efficiency in our drafting process. And so based upon the variants are identified, we can very easily sort of draft a, a case, um, both our, our incidental findings report and our primary indication report, and actually have this be able to be um, much more limited in the, in the time it takes for our genetic counselors and our geneticists to actually go through in, in, in drafting the, the complex reports. Um, and also, all of our confirmed interpreted variants are associated to the case in Gene Insight, and as well as our interpretations. So it much more easily enables the, the flow of this information into Gene Insight and into our reports, as well as the dissemination of this information into efforts like ClinVar and, and other laboratories who are sharing data with. So for the creation of the, the genome reporting process, obviously these are very complex. Um, they can be ambiguous. They, can, they could potentially be lengthy. 
Um, there's the risk of sort of doing any misinterpretation of the relevant results. Um, and there also could be the, um, because of their, their complex nature, could impede the incorporation of genomic data into clinical care. And so these are some of the things you need to think about when you're creating sort of genome report formats. So you want to be able to create reports that are, are effectively and efficiently um, communicate the data to the clinicians and to their patients, um, help provide insight to sort of future health and reproductive risk, and enable the physician to sort of take those next appropriate steps. Um, so this is a, a quick view of our, our primary indication report. Um, it's it's text-based today, but obviously um, a lot of things may need to change into a sort of more table format to really produce this information in, in a much clearer uh, manner. But really, the, the first thing that we focus on is identifying or just listing the, the most likely relevant variants. So these are the variants that we, we identified in this case. This is their... Um, the actual, the actual variants we've seen, this is how we're classifying it today within the laboratory. And if possible, if you actually have this information, particularly for de novo cases and recessive cases, uh, you may have the ability to sort of indicate the parental inheritance, which, which oftentimes is very useful in, in going through these cases. Um, that's sort of the, the first layout. So you have the overall result um, and, and sort of what that means for this particular individual and this specific phenotype they're being tested for. Um, once you have a list of variants, you can sort of do a, an overall summary of, of what you're looking at. And so one of the things that's important to know is, is for something like this, where they have this individual had a clear phenotype. So one of the first things we want to look at is the genes that are associated with this phenotype and knowing both if we identified any variants, but also the, the limitations. And so knowing that for these genes, actually a certain percentage of the coding regions actually wasn't able to be interpreted. And so there may actually be sort of rare pathogenic variants that are missing um, within those cases. And so it's important to be able to let the, the clinicians know what the limitations are for the specific, um, in general, but also for the specific genes that you're focusing on for a particular case. Um, and then sort of uh, you can do an analysis of, of or, or, or just let the clinician know what the variants you've identified are and how they sort of correspond to the particular phenotype you're identifying. And um, there's a chance for additional variants to identify. Maybe you thought this might be a de novo case. You can sort of say other variants that you've ruled out because of different metrics that didn't meet the criteria to be included on the report. Um, and so you can sort of add that information as well in, in the interpretation summary. Then the, the way we structure the report is we, we list the variants. We have the overall summary that, that's clear and laid out for the clinician. But then if they want the additional detail, they have the ability to come in here and and see sort of the detailed variant interpretation. So really the evidence for why our laboratory is calling this a likely pathogenic variant um, in Titan, or why we're calling this one a, a uncertain significant, but, but favoring pathogenic variant um, within Titan as well. And so you can actually see the detailed evidence around why we're classifying variants um, in particular uh, metrics. So that's the, the primary indication report. Again, we're also returning a, a general genome report, which is an expanded incidental findings report that we've helped develop um, with the MedSeq project. So the way we've wanted to develop this is sort of to have a, a one-page summary of the important findings for this particular individual, and then have more detailed um, information in the, 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 the um, next pages where they can actually dive in and, and see the reasons for classifications and what this really means for, the, for their patient. So the, the filtration metrics that we're, we're doing for um, general gene report, this is sort of a, a potential scenario. This is, is one example where you have, say, over 3 million SNVs, you have 500,000 indels, you limit this to um, genes, I mean, you have a, a much smaller number that are within the coding sequence of the splice site variants, you look for things that are reported in variant databases as disease causing, um, you do sort of the more rare um, findings, so you limit it based upon frequency, um, and then you look for sort of novel loss of function variants, and the novel loss of function variants, or rare loss of function variants within what we're calling this medical exome. Again, this is the, the, the list of genes that we've curated that we really think have some potential relevance to disease. And sort of from this filtration, you may get um, a few pathogenic variants here, a few pathogenic variants um, from this method, and then we're also actually including pharmacogenomic variants that we're looking at specifically um, to determine, and so th there's an additional set of variants um, for the pharmacogenomic effect. So this is sort of the, the way that you would limit it um, based on the filtration strategies and then the, the manual assessment of the variants. And then so what we want to do again is, is sort of develop a way to, to deliver this 
all those findings into a simple um, single page report. And so the way we structured it is we actually start sort of um, with an overall findings of the report. So we say that say 98% of the genome was covered and we called 4 million variants or whatever it is. Um, and then we get into a little bit more detail where we say for anything that's sort of a monogenic disease risk, um, so variants that are sort of inherited in, in a more dominant fashion, um, or potentially um, two recessive variants within the same gene, we actually have the ability, uh, or we, we lay out for the clinician the disease that, that's important with its inheritance pattern, um, the phenotype that is um, just sort of the initial phenotype, the one that they should know about that's important for this particular disease, uh, the variant that's identified as well as our overall classification. We do this similarly for anything we identify that's potential carrier risk, um, one thing that we also add for this table is often some of these things can have sort of carrier phenotypes. Um, and so it's important to be able to list what the potential carrier phenotypes may be. And so here we have the ability to say that for CF, um, this variant is, is pathogenic um, for CF and they're a carrier of that, but there's also uh, a risk of infertility um, for a male patient with someone who's carrying this um, CF variant. And so you can add additional sort of carrier phenotypes um, to this report and this sort of initial page summary that the doctor is looking at. Um, also for, for this, we're looking at sort of five uh, pharmacogenomic um, sort of, uh, not necessarily variants, but five pharmacogenomic effects. And so as a quick snapshot of sort of what is being done for these pharmacogenomic associations um, and what this means for their, the particular patient and including um, the, the different dosage requirements or anything, any risks that they have um, because of the variants that were identified. So this is sort of the first page overview that we have of the report. Then you have the ability to get into a little bit more details. And so again, this is sort of similar to what you saw on the primary indication report, um, although it's laid out a little bit more tabular of specific um, information about the disease. If we have the prevalence, if we have sort of any variant frequency of this, um, the interpretation, which is why we're calling this variant, in this case, pathogenic um, for episodic ataxia as well as some disease information and, and risk um, for the family. And you can sort of go through this in the different sections. We have sort of more detailed information for the pharmacogenomic variants. Um, and then obviously the methodology and limitations, as I mentioned before, are, are incredibly important. And so here it's sort of the methodology important both for the incidental findings and for the full primary indication report. It's important to note sort of what our, our minimum quality metrics are um, both for variant calling as well for the genome as a whole, um, what the filtration strategies we use in this particular case are in order to get down to the variants we've identified, and also what um, the inclusion criteria, what variants we're actually including on this report and which ones aren't. So the obviously one risk of potentially including something that says BUS likely pathogenic is the clinician might assume that all variants of unknown significance that you identified are included. But obviously that's not the case since pretty much every variant is a variant of unknown significance. So actually being able to um, say exactly what variants we're actually including on this final report is very important. Um, in addition, the, the limitations is, is important, particularly for the, the tests that we're doing and, and understanding, um, letting the clinician know the, the different aspects of, of genome sequencing. So first of all, genome sequencing is, is not whole genome sequencing. There's, there's obviously the ability, as I mentioned in the, earlier in the talk of, we don't know what the whole genome is. Um, and there's difficulty um, identifying variants with, with additional regions such as repeat expansion, translocations, um, large CNVs. We can't identify all variants just because we're not technically looking for CNVs and translocations at this moment in time. So being able to really say what the limitations of the particular assay are. Also knowing that, that not all variants are actually interpreted. Some of them just use sort of these filtration metrics to get to um, variants that we have the ability to do more manual interpretation on. We also don't know all the disease gene associations. And so it's important to remember that not everything um, we're looking at, we can even interpret today. And, and there's the ability to actually reinterpret things in the future that's going to be very important. Um, and also just in general variation in genes is still not well understood, similar to the, the gene disease associations isn't really well understood. And as I mentioned a second ago, the really the need to um, reinterpret genome data because the, the field is evolving so quickly and the clinical knowledge of, of the genome is evolving so quickly that there is a, a need to actually do this thorough reinterpretation um, of the genome, even for um, the, the, the internal findings report and for primary indication reports, and are able to let the clinician know um, 
what the sort of newest evidence levels are for, for different variants that were identified. So finally, once you have the, the reports, obviously it's important to the, deliver them to the clinician. Um, we're using um, here within partners, um, our, our gene and site clinic software, which is embedded within our EHR. So for anyone who actually is ordering um, locally from us um, within our institution, we actually are sending um, the reports directly to this gene and site clinic instance within our EHR. It actually helps us deliver these more structured PDF reports and not just HL7 based text, uh, HL7 based um, sort of test reports, which enables us to really give this much more structured view like you've seen in the, the general genome report um, that I just showed you. Um, it also tracks sort of if a report has been reviewed um, and also alerts that have been reviewed. And I'll, I'll touch on the alerts in, in the next slide. Um, and as I mentioned, sort of we're, we have this sort of in conjunction with our EHR, although there is the opportunity to have this sort of a, a standalone piece of software. And so really what it enables is is sending of the report to the clinician. Um, for genome sequencing, they, they may have a few more variants that they've identified here. They have the ability to sort of look at the, the full report, the ability to look at the, the variants are identified, um, what the reported category was, but importantly, actually, what the current category was. And so, because I mentioned before, genetic knowledge is, is changing rapidly all the time, it's important to be able to alert the clinician when that knowledge has changed. And so we've set up the system so when the variant gets reinterpreted within the laboratory, so say I'm, I'm the geneticist and I'm signing out a case um, and actually see a variant that I, I've seen before and there's new evidence now that suggests that it's not a VUS, it's actually pathogenic and I make that change. Any previous individual that had that variant, would the clinician would be alerted that there's been a, a classification change within that particular variant. So if you, you see here, you can um, initially this variant was, was reported as pathogenic, however, back in March of 2013, um, we reinterpreted this variant and are now calling it pathogenic. And so the clinician would have the ability to come and see this. If they click on that link, they get to sort of more detailed information. Again, that evidence section of why we're calling the variant um, pathogenic for this particular disease. And so because the, the field of genome sequencing and, and all clinical testing is, is um, rapidly evolving, we found it important and necessary to create sort of a somewhat automated way of alerting our clinicians when we have new knowledge and when it may be relevant um, for, for different treatment um, decisions for the particular patient. So this is a way for us to sort of deliver that knowledge um, to them. So with that, I just want to wrap up again and, and go through the, the, the genome sequencing process. Again, it's, it's really similar to, to what is being done in, in lab today, although it does have its, its, its um, specific points and, and caveats that, that are important to remember. So the, the phenotype um, is particularly important, again, for genome sequencing. The consent process and, and whether or not you actually go for um, research consent as well is very important. Um, sort of the idea between enrichment, filtration, and manual analysis and doing all that first and then going and confirming the variant um, and determining what gets on the report. And then the sort of the idea of having multiple different reports and multiple different layouts of, of reports um, sort of associated with a particular case. And finally, the, the need to sort of do the reinterpretation and the alerting to clinicians, as well as you need to get these variants into the EHR to enable longitudinal support and, and clinical decision support. So with that, I'd, I'd like to, to wrap up and, and, and take any questions. I want to um, obviously thank um, everyone who's, who's worked on this um, here within our laboratory and, and across the, the MedSeq project and, and a few of the other collaborations that we have. Um, obviously, this is sort of a short list. There's been many, many people involved in this effort to, to get genome sequencing um, launched within our laboratory. Um, and with that, I just want to, I'll, I'll take any questions. Um, I see that there are some questions already. Um, and also, I just want to mention that for the continuing education credits, make sure you, you log on to the Bioconference Live website um, into the CME section field to, to get the continuing education credits for this, this um, course. Um, so, I'm going to try to go through some of these questions. If anyone else has any additional questions, please um, feel free to, um, to, to forward these along. Um, so I see that there are some questions. Um, if anyone's interested in, in using sort of the, the spreadsheet that I mentioned for our novel variant assessment, um, today um, feel free to email me. My email is mlebo at partners.org, and I'd be happy to, to send that along and sort of with an SOP that we've developed in order to sort of work through that, that process. Um, someone mentioned, asked what, what the, the cost of, of, of a, a case um, for us is. And so a cost today, um, 
for us to do sort of genome sequencing for an individual is uh, $9,000. We have the ability also, if someone has previously had their sequencing done in a, in a CLIA lab using Illumina technologies, that we have the ability to, to do that um, interpretation process at a much more limited cost of um, $5,000 because we don't actually have to do the technical component. Um, we actually have the, um, the ability to sort of, um, someone else asked if we have the ability to work with international samples. We do international samples today, so we'd be happy to accept any sort of international samples um, for our case as well. I, I should also mention sort of in the, the cost of genome sequencing. Right now, we, um, it's $9,000 for a single genome for a trio. Um, it is $18,000, and, and we can help work with individuals um, for any sort of combination of, of, of people for sequencing that, that, that makes sense um, for that, those cases. Also for sort of um, having the family members available, that's sort of um, included in the cost um, for, for some of these um, interpretations as well. Um, so, so for um, the, the, the fill, the couple other questions that I'm looking at right now, um, someone asked if um, they understand correctly for the, the first several steps based on, are based on prior knowledge, and how, in this case, how you identify novel mutations. And so it's not necessarily based of, on, on prior knowledge. For, for incidental findings report, um, we're using both variants that have been previously identified as well as novel loss of function variants in what we're calling this medical exome. Um, however, for sort of the primary indication report, we're, we're gonna look at sort of all variants um, that meet certain criteria based upon genetics and, and gene disease association and look at those variants and, and be able to rank those and do manual assessment to identify which ones may be the most relevant um, for a particular sort of interpretation. Um, um, sorry, so, I'm, so someone else asked for, for variant confirmation. Um, obviously the, the functional knowledge of the pathway, um, it requires at some point functional knowledge of the pathway for which a gene is given. So for genes which there are functional tests, you confirm variants using traditional biochemical or molecular-based assays. So unfortunately, in, in a lot of clinical laboratories, they're not necessarily set up to actually do um, functional testing as well. Obviously, one of the benefits of potentially working with um, researchers is, is the ability to, if we identify novel variation, to establish, um, and, and we have such a, a, a good network here um, within Partners Health, Healthcare, to be able to sort of set up um, collaborations with researchers to help them do sort of functional assays for specific variants. And then we can maybe um, have a little bit more to say on, on novel variants and, and sort of what their relationship is to disease. But from a, a traditional sort of clinical lab approach, um, it's just really not within our scope of expertise to be able to do that sort of more traditional functional assays. And so it, it is much more limiting. So it is one of those opportunities I was mentioned to sort of work with researchers to be able to, um, to get variants interpreted um, more thoroughly based on functional data, because functional data is a very important way to help us classify variants. Um, so someone asked how many man hours are involved in report um, and how do we deal with the fact that the genes are poorly annotated um, and the single gene has as many entries in, in NCBI. And so obviously um, this, is, this is one limitation of genome sequencing and, and part of the reason for the, the, the increased cost of it is the amount of manual interpretation that has to be done. And so on average, when we do a novel variant assessment, um, it takes about um, 20 minutes for, or a little less than 20 minutes for variants that have no knowledge. However, by its nature, when we're looking at variants that have previous knowledge, there's a lot more literature. And so these ones can take from up to a half an hour to two hours, depending upon the amount of literature per variant. And so that's why the, the manual filtration step is incredibly important because we don't have the ability to actually go through um, sort of go through these all manually. So, so doing that filtration process to get down to the smaller set of variants becomes incredibly important in genome sequencing just because of the sort of the man hours it costs in order to do um, sort of the, the manual assessment of the variants, which is really the probably the most time consuming piece today um, for genome sequencing for, for hands-on components. I think I might have time um, for, for one more question. So, um, so someone asked if, if methylation filtration might reduce the, the cost of sequencing. Um, today, we, we don't do sort of um, 
methylation sequencing. So, so I think there's ways to sort of bring that information in um, and, and limit the scope of things that we end up sequencing, but it's not something that we actually offer today. Um, and again, for anyone who, who is interested, um, my email again is mlebo at partners.org. So M and then Lebo is my last name um, at partners.org. So thank you. Um, 